people you had to put your cassette in the car kind of place where you could really listen to it Andrew played Careless Whisper and I literally went cold just had this vision of this but I'd never heard a voice like this and I remember thinking the whole world is going to know this person Great pleasure to welcome Pepsi and Shirley. Oh, hello, hello, hello. I've, I've read the book and your friendship still seems incredibly strong. It goes back quite a while. I think the longer we've been friends, yeah, the stronger it's got, which is a great thing. Um, yeah, I mean, Peps, what do you think of our friendship? Has it got stronger? Well, let, let, let's just say we still laugh at each other's jokes. We still support each other when we need it. And um, if we argue, it's over nothing, really. So we make up very easily, you know, because it's never really that serious. Life isn't serious, really, is it, Paul? But really what's kept our friendship going, in all honesty, is being able to do this, being able to talk to each other so easily, because obviously True. in the eighties, I wouldn't have called Pepsi living in St. Louis. It would have been too expensive. So I've got to give thanks to technology that, this has really kept our friendship going to be able to see each other every week and chat for free. <laughs> yes. And this is how we wrote the book. I mean, you know, we were sharing pictures of our past and memories of things that we'd done together on, on technology. So, um, yeah. Actually, I, I wanted to talk about the pictures because quite often with books like this, you know, you, you see it in a bookshop and the first thing you do is you just flick, flick to the pictures, don't you? And yeah. there's some lovely kind of holiday snaps. They look like they've just come back from snappy snaps. You know, remember those? Most probably, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, your, your, your holiday photos look very much like everybody else's. And then all of a sudden you think, oh, hang on a minute. But that's, that's George Michael and there's Andrew Ridgely. And oh, it, it's quite different from most people's holiday experiences. Well, our holiday experiences was really being on tour. I mean, we experienced the whole world being on tour. So it was like free holidays, but you hated... You loved it when they said you've got a day off here and it's going to be warm. Spend the day by the pool. So that, that, but there were a lot of days when you didn't get to see much. So you'd travel everywhere. So we've got a lot of pictures of us sitting on a coach or sleeping on airplanes. So um, yeah, I mean the traveling part was amazing. So I'd never really traveled before before Wham. Although I mean I was still young when Wham started, obviously. But uh, that was to me the biggest highlight of, of being in a band was the travel. And the thing is with travel is that you go to the, like these amazing places. Sometimes you don't actually see the city. It's like about doing like the, the show and then you move on. But then we have moments where we have a bit of time off, say, for instance, in Australia, because that was really a memorable time for me and Sheryl, actually, because it was like, you know, we would relax, we'd go to the beach. But the thing is, if you went to the beach, if you got burnt and you were a, weren't able to put on your sort of like your show costume, you'd actually get fined. <laughs> and this is the we that we didn't wear was, yeah, yeah, exactly. So everyone used to sort of like lie out, you know, and wait, wait for the sun to hit their bodies and go as brown as you possibly can. And you might burn and you weren't allowed to say anything about it. But if it, disturbed your performance on stage you'd get fined well i got sunstroke in australia we got a letter warning the whole band anyone gets sunstroke and you'll get fined and it's how dangerous it is and i thought what a load of rubbish but all of a sudden <laughs> i'm shivering i'm freezing and i'm going to pepsi uh, i'm feeling cold but i feel hot and i couldn't let the sheet touch my body and she was going you've got a sunstroke so <laughs> you get went on stage, like shivering and <laughs> So, yeah. I want to go back to when, when you first first met. Um, that was in Shirley's car. And, and Shirley, your car and your ability to drive seems to me um, something that kind of almost got whammed together in the first place. It, your car comes up quite a lot, a lot in the story, doesn't it? It happened in my car, believe me. <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it all started in the car. Yeah, because I was obviously older than George and Andrew, and they were very impressed that I had my own car. Um, and yeah, so it would be the car that took us everywhere, back and forth to London, nightclubs, everywhere. So when obviously Pep, they said, We're, we've got to meet this new girl because DC, he left. They said, Shirley, would you drive up to uh, pick her up, chat to her in the car, see if you like her. And I picked her up and I liked her. And we had a long drive back to George's house. I was very impressed. 
because you know I was sort of like a city of London girl, urbanite, always on the buses, always going by train, sometimes walking. So I knew I, I did, actually didn't know anybody with the car. So when this like blonde bombshell turns up, I'm like, wow, this is really. Yeah, it was just like, you know, I was very, very impressed. But the wonderful thing was that, like Shirley says, we got on. We could not stop talking. And, and it was like, that was it. And it's been the same ever since. So how were you invited to, to join the band? Well, the thing is, I, I got this very mysterious call um, to come and audition for this band. And at the time, I was doing like these session singing jobs in 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 labrick grove west london that's where I kind of i grew up. and i was doing stuff for nothing because all i wanted to do was be in the studio and sing and then i got this phone call and it was like hi this is simon napier bell's um office we understand you're a singer and we, your name has been given to us would you come to such and such a studio we'll send you a tape and we want you to sort of listen to it and come along. And that was it. And I went along and I ad-libbed and I met Simon Napier Bell. It was like, would you like to go on a tour with um, a group called Wham? And I'm like, what? But I was very cool. I was very laid back about it. But much later, I got really, really excited. As you know, it's all in the book. So um, it was very, it was like a, my life changed in that moment. Yeah, but I was very blasé about it. And Shirley, you you were already friends with with George and Andrew from school days, in fact. That's right. Yeah. So when I'm, so I was a year above them. So I didn't hang out with them at school, but we I bumped into Andrew once we had all left school, and we just remembered each other from school. Um, spoke about music the whole night because I was, I just spent my whole time seeing watching live bands. I went through the whole punk thing, watching bands. And it was just something I love. So I hadn't met someone so passionate about music. So we, he ended up going, oh, you've got to come and, and see and see Yog. And I was going, no, who's Yog? And I couldn't remember who Yog was from school. And then as soon as we went to his house, I drove, um, and he opened the door, I thought, oh, the boy used to play violin. So I remembered him. Um, and it was so lovely because the three of us, as fast as I connected with Pepsi and my car, um, me, George and Andrew just got on so well and we we just don't know it's just a connection that I'd not really had before so instant and they were in a band a ska band called The Executives and I went and they said oh let's go to a rehearsal in my car <laughs> um, there it is again I should have kept that car the, it was awful they couldn't get themselves together to, to rehearse they were just like arguing oh stop wait a minute you know when they get up when the drummer's bashing you got the lead guitarist doing that and no one's listening to the <laughs> singer. Go, just wait, wait. And I thought, oh, this isn't going to happen. This is really boring. Um, and then George and Andrew kept writing songs. And meanwhile, we are clubbing in the 80s because it's a big club scene or the new romantic scene. And we would rehearse kind of dance routines in George's bedroom. So we'd go out and we'd do these dance routines. And then when the boys got the record deal, uh, they were asked to do a PA. And I remember George said to me, would you do a PA with us? And I went, of course I will. But what is a PA? I didn't understand what a PA <laughs> was. Because I'd only seen bands, live bands, like proper kind of big band doing a gig. And he goes, oh, we have to go to a club and we have to dance and we have to mime. And I remember thinking, that is awful. No one is, go is they're going to boo us off. Like who wants to go and see people dancing and miming? We did that. And it was such a hit that, like, within a couple of weeks, we were on uh, Saturday Morning Superstore. So it's not that it just happened so quickly. So, you know, it's like fate, really, that we all met, we got on, we had this formula that worked, and uh, Wham! just took off like a rocket. When did you know George was something more than just another run-of-the-mill pop star? Back to my car. <laughs> Andrew. It's a Capri, isn't it? This this car as well. I did have a Capri, but the first car that I had was a mini. Oh, what's the? the it was a mini with wood paneling. Oh, There's the Clubman. Name. Mini mini the Clubman. Mini Clubman. Yeah. There, wow. The Shakespearean the car, I always thought. Yeah, like a I Tudor a car mini, with. Yeah, beige mini Clubman. It had wood wow. panel, a state car to get good stuff in the back, and on the way to George's, the first time I met him again. 
Andrew had a cassette because that's where you listen to all your music. We had to put your cassette in the car, kind of place where you could really listen to it. Andrew played Careless Whisper. And I literally went cold and just had a vision. So I'm always very intuitive, just had this vision of this. Bo- I'd never heard a voice like this, first of all. It was just something I hadn't heard before in a male singer. And I remember thinking the whole world is going to know this person. This is going to know him. Like that voice is just so appealing to every sensory cell in your body. So, um, and yes, that, it was true. And, and Pepsi, you were one of the first people that George came out to when you were filming. No, that was me. No, oh, that, that, was, that, that, that was Shirley. Right. Um, yeah, we were filming Club Tropicana in Ibiza, talking about getting tans. And George said, come, o- come over a bit earlier because we, we should get really good tans. Because the <laughs> 80s was huge about having a big tan. And so I went out. He was there already. I went out the day after because I couldn't go the day he went. And he met me and he kept saying, oh, I really need to talk to you. I need, need to tell you something. And I kept thinking, what's the, you know, we always had kind of heart to heart talks. So it wasn't kind of unusual for us to have these heart to heart talks. So when he said to me, I'm, well, I can't remember exactly when he said I'm gay. I just wasn't really that bothered by it because I wasn't surprised. And I think he was shocked how kind of I didn't really react to him saying it. We were shocked and relieved. Um, and it's so that makes me so sad because then being gay, you know, well, you've come from the 70s and 60s where, when was it illegal? In the 60s? And, and I think up until 1967, I think. Yeah. It was illegal. So imagine yeah. you've got this thing that was illegal and, and shamed and, and it brings shame to your family and maybe could ruin your career. So that that is so, so sad. Um, but I'd, I'd known loads of gay people. So I wasn't kind of shocked. I wasn't bothered. And years and years later, he always said, it kind of really helped me that you weren't bothered to the fact that you kind of ignored it and just brushed it. Like, all right, I don't want to talk about that anymore because it left him feeling, oh, maybe it isn't such a big thing. But yeah, I mean... I, I knew kind of quite a few young gay guys who wouldn't tell their family, but it was so obvious they were gay. Yeah. Uh, but and George had a gay uncle as well, didn't he? He, he? he wrote a song about him. He did, but I don't think he ever met him. Yeah. But the thing, the thing about the, the, that around that time, you know, it was about being private as well. Obviously you share with your best friend and hopefully your family, but again, at the same time, it was a little still taboo. So you had to sort of tell your nearest and dearest, but you wanted to keep it private. Well, now, nowadays, you're kind of out there, you know, literally out there. So it was a very, very, very different time. But scooting back to what Shirley says about her playing music in her car, George still, he, he used to still do that. So for instance, he used to say, Pets, I've got this track. I want to play it to you and we'll be out. We'll be out sort of going out to a club or a restaurant and everything. And I'd be sitting in his car and he'd like pump up the volume and he'd just play a track. And so it was something that he still did, even when he was like being a big George Michael star. It was something that he still kind of, right, sit in the car, listen to this track, you know. So I think- he almost wanted your approval. Sorry, well, sorry. it wasn't a case of that. I, that. What I love was the fact that it was in his car. Mm. You know, it wasn't in some big studio. He just wanted to, you that was to always his test. It. Sounds good yeah. in the car because yeah. I think that's what you get from growing up. With, you know, you listen to the radio. So the nearest thing you can kind of imagine that it sounds good is going in your car. What imagine it's on the radio. So I think that's where that kind of stemmed from. Yeah. But, and, and I do think the car is a great place to listen to music. Actually, my son, whenever he gets in my car, oh, my goodness, has to have all his songs lined up. It's like he can't travel without his music playing. Mm-hmm. So there's something very con- that connects music and travel. It's, it's a really nice combination. I listened to your two hit singles um, whilst I was reading the book, and they, they sound great still, don't they? Really, do good, they? Goodbye, I Stranger. Goodbye, Stranger. What a track that is. The, fun, the, the intro oh, God, is such a brilliant. Big song to sing as well. Well, whenever we've done that live, we're like, 
Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask you too about being backing vocalists. I mean, but what's, what is that like? Because, you, you know, you're traveling with the band. You're not singing the full song sometimes. Right? You're, you're no. you know, doing the doo-wop stuff and the, sorry, that I don't know what you would call those vocals, but, you oh. know, you're doing the sort of scat vocals in the right. background. Well, the thing is for us, we we were very, we were actually quite fortunate as far as we weren't sort of stuck in the back doing vocals. We were actually up front with George and Andrew. They had like a set of backing vocals, but we were part of the show, which was like, it was something that I had to actually get used to because I was like, okay, I'm going to be a backing vocalist for Wham! But it was like, Andrew was like, I remember being very kind of a bit concerned as to when am I going to do my backing vocals? And he's like, and I said this to Shirley and Shirley was like, okay, let me talk to the boys about this. Cause she didn't know how to answer me. And it was like, Andrew said to me, he says, right, Peps, do you want to be stuck behind a microphone doing the backing vocals or do you want to be up front with us? And that's what happened. We ended up being like the dancers and part of the entertainment and everything. So we were just up there with the boys. I mean, which one would you choose? I chose being up there with the boys. So Shirley and I, we didn't do the vocals. We were up there singing, well, kind of miming. We we were just doing the vocals on stage to the songs that we came on for. So we weren't on. So when the shows were live, we didn't do every song. You know, we only came on for some of the singles. So we weren't on the stage for every single show. So that was the thing that they were saying, like, no, we need you girls up front. We don't want you doing backing. You've got to come on for different songs, different outfits. So that was their concept. So that's... And the thing is with the fans, they were beginning to say Petsy and Shirley. Petsy and Shirley, you know, we were becoming... That, that was the first of Pepsi and Shirley. Initially, I wasn't sure if there was going to be a Pepsi and Shirley. You know, I thought, you know, Wham was going to kind of come to come to an end at some point. And, you know, Shirley would do her thing and I would do. My, but the thing is, we actually started to build Pepsi and Shirley. We, we started to become sort of like our own personalities in a way. So... Brilliant. I mean, you know, we wouldn't be sitting here with you otherwise. So good choice, I think. Yeah. What a launch pad. What an absolute launch pad for Mm -hmm. you. Well, sometimes I think in life you get opportunities and you have to see what's the right thing. And a lot of people don't take these opportunities. I've always I always know those moments when they're opportunities. And I think if someone says, would you like to come in? I mean, for me, the first opportunity I got was, would you come and do a PA? We just mime and dance. And I could have, I, there was a big part of me that says, oh my God, no, I don't fancy that. I feel embarrassed to be doing that. But I just took it as, yeah, why not? It's, it's going to be fun. And I'm so pleased that I did because there was another girl that we asked to do it. And she was like, oh no, I don't, I, I want to be a serious singer and I want to do that. But, you know, that's, that's a choice you have to make. And yeah, it's an opportunity. So that's how I've always seen it. I want to ask you, um, how do you think George felt during his life? Do you think he felt appreciated? Do you think he felt loved by his fans? Oh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the success of your record sales is is how you judge people and your fans. But, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't that he was looking, he wanted to create such perfection that he wouldn't, his respect for people was you're not going to get anything that isn't approved by me, anything that I don't love. So that's like his integrity for his music and his pride of his music. He wanted it to be a hundred percent amazing for everyone to relate to and to listen to. And, and it has, you know, it's absolutely, absolutely yeah, is that. Absolutely. I mean, he refers to his fans as his lovelies, you know, um, and they still regard themselves as lovelies. And they are lovely because I tell you what, if you say anything that is bad about George, they'll come at you. They're very defensive and they're very, they really hold his music, his image, who he was very highly. And the thing is, you know, I mean, a lot of the fans that, that even interact with us, those were the fans that would be outside his house 
they'd be like, you know, wherever he lived, that's where they were. And he would go out and he would talk to them, so, you know, and he was always very good like that. So his fans were very important to him. And I think his fans were very varied. There were people who would most yeah. often there were people buy his music just for his music, not really interested in him. Yeah. Um, a lot of great songwriters would be a fan of his because he is such an amazing writer. So, yeah, I, I, I think he wasn't some type of just, oh, he's a good looking guy. Let's just fancy him fans. I think his fans are genuine, genuinely appreciative of his music and lyrics, etc. And I think with this 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 new older remix, it's it's for the fans. It's for the fans. And yes, obviously you want other people to sort of look at those who never looked at George Michael to look at George Michael. But can you imagine? It's apparently it's gonna have I was reading about the on, no, on the, the great side. collection. It's got like I, a CD vinyl. I mean, it's just amazing. I love a copy. I haven't got my copy yet. I hope I do get it. But I mean, it's gonna be like this incredible box set of great music that you're going to be able to keep and hold as if, I mean, it's just fantastic. That was a fantastic album as well, wasn't it, Older? I think he yeah. referred to it as, as his greatest, his greatest um, work that he's left us. I mean, lyrically, I love it. What I do love about having modern technology again, as much as I hate a lot of modern technology, I love that I can have Alexa on and she shows me the lyrics. And I still, when I play his song, sometimes will stand there just staring at the lyrics because it's such a journey and it's such an insight and it's clever and it's emotional. So it's really good to, to look at the lyrics as he's singing and then once you kind of got that concept. But he's just such a great writer. Every, every song is a different phase of emotion, like a journey. It's not predictable. You don't know where he's going to go with the lyrics, which was really love George George I say is because sometimes I do feel him you know I, I, in the music as well obviously sensitive like very sensitive to what was going on obviously in his own life but also what was going out on out in the world like the politics and he was quite kind of forward thinking sometimes he would say things it's oh no you don't know what you're talking about and then you know a few months later you'd see it kind of come to pass so he was very conscious as to what was going on not only in his life but also around him that you know he was questioning and he was like really having his own insights about and you just sort of hear it in his music really that's what a good great artist is someone who could look at the environment and really bring it into his, into the creativity, so. But sometimes I think when someone's that bright or that intelligent and that sensitive, that mix, it can also be, it must be really hard because he's out there and he's seeing things that a lot of us aren't seeing. Like as Pepsi said, he would tell, to have a chat with you and talk about something and be so concerned about a situation. You're thinking, you know why? But he's, he's actually had such insight, mm. so. But that's what makes it that genius, I guess. We, we could talk about him for hours, I think, but I want to drag it back to the book, which is uh, now out in paperback. Um, whose idea was it to, to alternate the chapters? Because, you know, you, you each take a chapter, don't you? Pepsi writes one, then Shirley writes one. I think that's, that's well, a that's strong idea. idea of how we're doing this now. So we couldn't work out how it would get messy if we interact it. So... I felt like Pepsi is one side of the world, I'm the other. So we, we have to kind of put it in order. And what was quite nice was Pepsi was, Pepsi's a great writer, by the way, I have to add. I, very much. He really is a great writer. And I would read, I was like, she would write a, a, a chapter and I would read it. And I was just like, I don't want to mess in that. That's so good. It's like, you've got to, she said, it was just so, and it was lovely to read things that Pepsi had written that I didn't know because there's something very different about sitting down and writing to yourself about your memories that you wouldn't have in a, in a conversation. Yeah. And yeah. the thing is for, 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 for me, and I, I would say for both of us, we, we began to see how we, we kind of complemented each other, even before we knew each other, how similar and unsimilar we were in our lives and the, the fact that we were kind of on different paths and we came together um, and looking back and seeing where Shirley had come from, where I'd come from, things that we'd gone together. It was, 
it was inevitable we were going to be a duo, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, and the fact that we still have our friendship, I think it's, it's respecting our own characters of each other. You know, I don't want to be Shirley. Shirley doesn't want to be me, but we appreciate each other for, for who we are. So the fact that it's chapter after chapter, it's the way that our careers have been anyway. You know, there's Shirley, who's Shirley, the blonde, and there's me, the dark you know, the whole black and white thing. So it was, it, it worked really, really well that way. And I, I love the one, if we just end with this one, I, I thought this was a lovely tip, send the flowers now. Explain what yes. that is. I love that one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's like say you love someone now, don't wait. Absolutely, don't wait, don't wait. Just make that phone call when you think of that person. That's something that I always tend to do. I've kind of started to do for no reason whatsoever it doesn't have to be a birthday or any any kind of celebration just surprise that person with a hello That's but pepsi, well pepsi is much better she'll ring me and say or she'll send me a message saying how are you and there's a kind of question mark and it may and there are times when i've been really low and it's as if she's known so Pepsi is more of the instigator. She'll call me a lot more. Whereas if I'm feeling low, I'll kind of go hide a bit. So yeah. Sh Shirley's the busy bee. She's always busy, busy, busy. Yeah, busy, busy, I'm very busy. busy but, <laughs> but it is good to, to love people and appreciate people and let them know it. And, and any plans to do it a big event to remember George? Uh, I don't think Not that has that been. I know really. of at the moment, no. Just I think this older compilation coming out is like a, a, a biggest way you can appreciate him because the one thing that he that his music was like his children and he know he knew he was on earth to create music so the biggest compliment anything could happen is appreciate his music go out and get that album and put put the lyrics on <laughs> yes and like he said himself listen without prejudice as well isn't it that was what that whole album the other album title was about wasn't it it's Forget what you think about me. Listen, listen to this with unprejudiced ears. Absolutely, yeah. I think I think that's how you should take on all forms of art. Do just not go with an open mind, open heart, and just see what resonates with you. So that's a, a great title, I reckon. And your book title is "It's All in Black and White." There it is in print. Pepsi and Shirley, thank you so much for spending some time with us. Thank you thank so you. much. Okay. It's been wonderful.